This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. We're spending the hour marking the 50th anniversary of the deadliest prison uprising in the history of the United States, speaking with a formerly incarcerated survivor who was shot several times by state troopers. In a minute, we'll be joined by one of the negotiators who were brought in by the prisoners and the filmmaker who helped uncover the evidence of what really happened. A warning again that today's show includes graphic, painful descriptions and images. This clip from the new HBO Max documentary, Betrayal at Attica, shows how misinformation spread about how the hostages who were killed during the Attica uprising actually died. This is New York prison system spokesman Gerald Houlihan saying this hostages had their throats slashed, and then the county medical examiner, Dr. John Edland, who contradicts him. But first, we hear from attorneys Liz Fink and Bill Kunstler. If they had only waited till today, there would be now 40 or 41 people still alive in this universe of ours. They would not wait because these men were expendable. Guards, prisoners had no meaning in the scheme of things of our white totalitarian world. How did they kill them? Well, several uh, had their throats slashed. Uh, I don't have all the details on it. I understand one had a chest wound that he died from, and I don't have all of those details. But when you read the front page of the New York Times, it's a scream. It is. I mean, they have them fighting hand by hand in the blocks for four hours. I mean. The press accepted Houlihan's report of slashed throats, but the next day, county medical examiner John Edland announced the truth. The first eight autopsies were on the cases identified to us as hostages. All eight cases died of gunshot wounds. He was this conservative Republican, and he was a doctor. So, you know, they brought all these bodies to him, and he says, oh, these were all shot. <laughs> you know, nobody's, what are you talking about? There was no evidence of slashed throats. There was one single cut in the back of one of the necks. And they totally attacked him and destroyed him, actually. And this is another clip from Betrayal at Attica. On the night of September 13, 1971, 50 years ago today, New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller called President Nixon to update him on the retaking of Attica. Their conversation was recorded on the same machines that brought down Nixon's corrupt administration three years later. This is part of their call. I know you've had a hard day, but uh, I want you to know that I just back you to the hilt. Uh, the courage you showed and the judgment in not granting amnesty, it was right, and I don't care what the hell the papers or anybody else says. Uh, I don't care what they say. I think uh, that, that you had to do it that way, because if you would have granted amnesty in this case, it would have meant that you would have had prisons in an uproar all over this country. That's right. And you, you did the right thing. It's a tragedy that these poor fellows are shot, but uh, I just want you to know that's my view, and I pulled a troop around here there to back that right to the hilt. Well, aren't you great, Mr. President? I, I only called you because I wanted to uh, alert you that we were going in, and right. when we went in, we couldn't tell whether all 39 hostages would be killed and maybe two or 300 prisoners. Yeah. And that's a pretty big, uh, Boy. you know, yeah. mm -hmm. they did a fabulous job. How many, uh, we, I, I just, I only got the report this morning. What is the latest uh, report? How many Seven people? Seven hostages were killed. Seven hostages were yeah. killed. These were the guards. It was a guard. Seven. It appears now, Mr. President, as though quite a few of those were killed prior to this. In other words, that they'd been dead. Uh -huh. You can, you can prove that, can't you? I mean, uh, this is the hospital. The hospital can prove that. Oh yeah. They can, they can find out how long guys did. That's right. And there, it's a Catholic uh, yeah. hospital, so it's yeah. outside of our jurisdiction. Right. So tell me this: Is this a? Are these primarily blacks that you're dealing with? Oh yes. This, there was the whole thing was led by the blacks. I'll be darned. Are all the prisoners that were killed blacks? Uh, are there any I whites? I haven't got that report, but I have to. I would yeah. say just offhand, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, we did it, though, only when they were in the process of murdering the guards or when they were attacking our people as they came in to get the guards. You had to do it. And otherwise, we were captured all the cell blocks and so forth without uh, shooting a shot. Mm -hmm. And no troopers uh, 
uh, were wounded. One of them, well, one of them was in the leg. Mm -hmm. But uh, only one trooper was wounded. Good. That's right. Good. It really was Good. a beautiful operation. Well, it really was a beautiful operation, New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller said on that day. In fact, Nelson Rockefeller would then become vice president under President Ford. For more, we're joined by David Rothenberg, a member of the Attica Observers Committee. He was one of 35 people brought into Attica to negotiate on behalf of prisoners. He's founder of the Fortune Society, which was relatively new at the time of the uprising, um, that helped people who got out of prison reintegrate into society. Also with us, Michael Hull, director of the new HBO documentary film Betrayal at Attica that plays this conversation between President Nixon and then New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller. David Rothenberg, um, your thoughts on what happened and why, when you were negotiating with so many others between the prisoners and the state, Rockefeller decided to simply have the troopers open fire? Amy, we were brought in as observers. The inmates were the negotiators. As it went along, some of our, some of the observers, like Bill Kunstler and Congressman Badillo and Tom Wicker, were a little more sophisticated than people like myself who were new in this whole arena, and they were giving advice. But what had happened is, in the takeover, you said earlier that one of the guards had been beaten up and two of the inmates in the takeover. And Officer Quinn, during the negotiations, the word came out that Officer Quinn had died. And that changed the whole tone of the negotiations because amnesty was taken off the table. But the irony of that for me, and, and, and I, I always say this, I brought nothing to what happened in the yard that day. I was an observer. What I came away with was life-changing because what the state did is they went in and killed, as we learned, nine of the nine of the hostages. They wouldn't continue the negotiations because one guard had died, but they then killed the uh, killed the hostages. And you know, years later, a man named Malcolm Bell, who was hired by the state to uh, to investigate all of what was Attica, suddenly had a press conference and said the state's been lying through the whole time. And he was a he Republican. He was a conservative Republican, wrote a book called The Turkey Trot, and we, st we started communicating, and he was giving us chapter and verse. But I think one of the most significant things about all of this, beyond just Attica, because Attica is all of us, has become a motto, is every time I talk about Attica, there's always someone that reminds me, well, these men had committed serious crimes, and they were dangerous, et cetera. The irony in our prison system, and Attic is almost the epitome of it, is that people went in there, having been charged and convicted of serious crimes, they went into an atmosphere that nurtured the very behavior that got them in there. There was nothing in Attica or in, in much of the prison system around the country that gave people an opportunity to confront why they are there and what they could do to lessen the possibility when they go back to the communities. And Attica was, uh, as, as uh, Tyrone, and, and Tyrone should be thanked for continuing to be a voice for those who are no longer here to tell the story, that uh, you don't go into a place and be given one roll of toilet paper a month and feel disgusting about yourself, where well, you're going in with self-negated feelings to begin with, and they do everything in the institution. And when and when— uh, when Tyrone talked about those sticks that they stop and go with, they were called, I can't say the word, the end stick. The guards called them the end sticks, the, and they nurtured the hostility. And the other thing was on the takeover, there was, a, I know at least one white it may die, because two people were died, were killed after the takeover because they were targeted. One was Sam Melville, and the other was L.D. Barkley. Barkley, because he had been such an, had been on, on the news coverage when the cameras went in had been such an articulate uh, spokesperson for the inmate perspective. And Sam Melville be was targeted because he had been a political weatherman and had helped uh, with some of the black inmates like Roger Champion and Herbert X. Blyden to break down the, the differences. The inmates were kept, as, as Tyrone pointed out, inmates were always kept apart. That, that's how they kept control, pitting white against black with Puerto Ricans in the middle. People like Herbert Blyden and Roger Champion and Sam Melville, black and white, said, together we're stronger, we can affect change. 
to improve the conditions, to create opportunities, to have education programs. That was threatening to a, an institution that only knew how to run pun by punishment. And so the Attica, the, the event itself is almost a microscopic view of the failure of our criminal justice system and in our prison system. And that conversation a, between President Nixon and then New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller? Well, I've always, uh, from all the Attic Observers Committee, we met weekly at Bill Kunstler's house. And one of the things that I've clearly come to the conclusion is that Nelson Rockefeller was making choices as he was reconstructing his political image. The Rockefeller drug law, which followed soon after, he wanted to run for president. He was perceived as an Eastern liberal. He was reconstructing. This was calculated. And so the decision to send in troops was all part of the plan to begin with. And it was decided, as Herman Badillo told us, that they waited till Monday morning because they were afraid there would be unrest in the ghetto as they described it, if they went in on Sunday. So they waited till Monday morning. And they could have taken over the institution with the gas, with the mace, and never shot a single bullet. But that was a—, uh, a that Herman and Herman Badillo and, and uh, Tom Wicker were on the phone with Rockefeller on Sunday night imploring. And that's when Herman said, uh, there's always a time to die, which became the title of Tom Wicker's book. Uh, Wicker was a columnist for The Times, and he and Herman had a lot of a lot of sway and power and had access to uh, Rockefeller. And they pleaded with him, give us more time to talk. And the choice was political. It was made in Albany. It wasn't made it wasn't made uh, at Attica at all. It was a hmm. political decision. I want to bring Michael Hull into the conversation. This new HBO Max documentary, Betrayal at Attica, is horrifying. Um, as you use archival footage, some of it never before known. Um, and also, the lies, the cover-up. I mean, you have David mentioning the conservative Republican investigator writing a book, um, ultimately, about what he found, uh, and that book called um, The Attica Turkey Shoot, Carnage, Cover-Up and the Pursuit of Justice, by Malcolm Bell. Um, and, of course, you hear Tyrone um, talking about, uh, in our last segment, uh, Tyrone Larkins talking about what happened. Why was it so important for you to make this film, Michael? I spent a lot of time with Liz Fink, and Liz had preserved this archive. The state of New York has been saying for 50 years that this evidence doesn't exist, that it was destroyed, whatever the case may be. And, and the, the state police conducted the retaking of the prison. They also conducted the investigation of themselves. So they started destroying and, and obfuscating evidence on September 13th, 1971. And Liz managed to find this evidence, um, and she used you know some of it in the civil trials that she was you know kind of the the leader of. And she you know the state of New York continued to act like this evidence didn't exist, and the evidence proves exactly what she said all along. And you know what David and Tyrone have said, they planned this thing and they did exactly what they planned. They wanted a massacre. And Liz always felt like it was intended to stop protest in this country. She felt like they were tired of all the protests that had been taking place and they were not trying to see protests move into the prison space. And they felt like they could murder these men and get away with it. And it was more important to to stop this rebellion and make their point than it was even to protect their own employees. You know, it wasn't just wasn't just inmates who were murdered. They murdered their own employees, and all of them were citizens of the state of New York. All of them were supposed to be looked after in one way or another by the governor, and and he chose to kill them instead. And so, for them to to carry all of this out in such a cynical and 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 manipulative kind of way, and then to just act like it didn't exist or it never happened, um, you know, Liz was. Very offended, you know, and and she was and an ultimately organizer. won she that twelve me. million dollar settlement for the prisoners. And Frank Big Blacksmith would also fight for a settlement for the workers, for the prison guards as well. We have ten seconds, Michael. Liz wanted to make sure that everybody could see this evidence because she knew that if people could see it, they would never believe the lies of the state of New York again. So it's been my charge to make sure it's available to people. And all of the evidence is online at atticamaskers.com as well as in the film.
I want to thank you all for being with us. Michael Hull, director of the new HBO Max documentary, Betrayal at Attica, not to be missed. I want to also thank David Rothenberg, one of the Attica observers and founder of the Fortune Society. And, of course, Tyrone Larkins, formerly incarcerated at Attica, survived despite being shot by state troopers. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.